So when you fall, the difference in workload to your legs is that when you can run in a controlled fall, all you have to do is exert the amount of energy to pick up your feet. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, whose favorite Rocky movie is Rocky VI, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 24 of the Running For Real podcast. So last week, we talked to Mark Kukuzela and Josh Emder, who talked about, well, we talked about health and how we as runners are not actually as safe as we think, especially from those long-term or metabolic diseases. And, you know, I know you guys are good people. You want to help others. You want to help your family, your friends, your community. But, you know, it can be really tough to know how. Like, what do you do to help those people? So we talked about that. And we also found uh, they've created a amazing solution. It's the best I've heard of for runners who are struggling to find a good medical professional in, well, in your area, basically. So make sure you go check that one out if you did miss it. Now, today I'm talking to a runner, a coach, an instructor who has impacted, I don't know, probably hundreds of thousands of runners in his years of teaching. And that was mostly because he found the connection between Tai Chi and running. And yes, those two can work together. And what my guest teaches will really make you think about your running and the way that you run and what you could be doing differently, especially if you find you are forcing things a lot, which I know I'm guilty of just as much as anyone else. So you've probably heard of chi running or chi walking. And after this, most likely you're probably going to go and want to go buy one of his books, go to one of his workshops, as everything he says just makes total sense. So I want to welcome Danny Dreyer. And after a quick word from UCAN, we will be right to the interview. But one thing I want to say about this UCAN is actually they have bumped up the Running For Real discount code to 15%. So in this ad message, I actually say 10%, but it is 15% just to give you a little bit more. So thanks for UCAN for that one. All right, let's get on with the interview. Smoothies, recovery bowl, bars, cookies, biscotti. What do all of those have in common? Any ideas? You can make them with Generation You Can. How's that for a win-win? Learn more about Generation You Can at generationyoucan.com and I will give you a coupon code later in the episode for 10% off. Danny, thank you so much for joining me on the Running For Real podcast. I am so excited that you are here. You are someone I've been following for years. I know a lot of my listeners are going to love to hear from you as they are very aware of you. Maybe even some of them you have taught before, who knows? But welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Tina. It's great to be here. Yeah. And this is something that I think people are really going to find interesting, especially if they haven't heard of it before. But as I mentioned, I'm sure quite a few have. So Mm -hmm. I know this is a question you've had probably a thousand, a hundred thousand times. But tell us about um, chi running. Do you say chi or chai? Chi. Because I feel like I would say, yeah, I guess it would be chi. Tai Chi. Yeah. Um, I just felt like with my accent, sometimes I feel like I say things differently. So I always get confused. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah. um, So you're the co-founder of Chi Walking and Chi Running. So maybe tell us a bit about what it is for those who don't know. Well, what it is was um, basically I come from a background of ultra marathoning. So I did that for quite a few years. And um, and then at some point in my running history, uh, after I'd been running about 25 years of me to a local Tai Chi instructor that had just moved. I grew up in Boulder, Colorado, so I was used to running lots of trails and long distances, but um, I've always been fascinated by Tai Chi because I'm half mm-hmm. Chinese, mm-hmm. and so I wanted to say I went to the class, and the guy from the first day I went to the class, he was talking about alignment and posture, and so alignment in, in your support stance but relaxation in all the moving parts. Mm-hmm. And so I said, wow, I wonder if I could throw that into my ultra running. <laughs> and the next day I went out running and I had been working on this stuff with a lean, which is a big part of 
to running, but I, I threw this posture alignment with and really tried to relax my shoulders and hips and arms and legs. And I came back from my run and I really didn't feel like I'd gone out for a run. And that's when I the light bulb went off in my head and, and it and I just realized that there is really something to building a connection between these two uh, well-established sports. And um, the more I studied it, the more it was really starting to rock my boat, you mm-hmm. know. And so I started developing it into classes. I started teaching people and having such great results that my wife, who comes from a publishing background, mm-hmm. said, there's a book in this. You should write a book. Mm-hmm. And if if you would have known me in the past, I had no, <laughs> you would have said I was going to write a book. I would have said, you are nuts. <laughs> you know, so, um, but once I found my voice, it was really easy. I could just write how I talk. And that was, I said, I could do that all day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so, so that started this whole thing. And then, um, she's, uh, the business person behind all of this. Mm-hmm. And so she was always planning ahead. Well, if you have a book, then you have to have instructors to teach this. Otherwise somebody's going to take your book and go teach it. Yeah. Uh, on their own. And so by the time the book was published in 2004, it was published by Simon and Schuster. We ended up with a good publisher. And so it ended up being in all the bookstores. And um, that was still when Amazon was smaller. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, we were in, got got a really good uh, coverage in all the bookstores. Plus, we had a good instructor base by the time the book was launched. So there were people I could send people to, to go learn this. Mm -hmm. And I was teaching a lot, a lot of classes back then myself. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, now we have over, uh, well over 200 instructors all over the world. Wow. That's great. All the way to Perth, Australia, we got an instructor. I mean, they're Mm -hmm. everywhere. So uh, that's the start of it. But basically it's based in that connection, all the great principles that make Tai Chi such an incredible martial art and in China, they call it actually longevity training oh, really? because it's so good Makes for sense. your body, yeah. gives you range of motion, tones your muscles, gets your balance good, strengthens your core, all of that stuff. And so uh, it's a natural fit for runners. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's called Qi Running. Yeah. Did it kind of shock you when you made that realization that no one had thought of this connection before? Yeah, it kind of shocked me because... Nobody had ever really taught anybody how to run when I came out with this. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this is a 1999 and I would advertise running classes and people go, what do you mean? Teach me how to run. run." (laughs) It's like, what, tell me how to talk or something, you know? And uh, and so it was very uphill battle trying to get people to think about Mm -hmm. paying attention to how they move. Uh, But one thing I had going for me is that back then, as is still true today, 65% 65% of all runners get hurt every year. Yeah. Yeah. So I had that statistic going for me. Well, well, are you hurting right now? And they'd go, yes. And I go, well, there might be something you're not doing right. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you changed how you move. You could eliminate the need for injury. So and maybe you give us some examples of what you mean by that with like how, when you say about, you know, making, you said about making this alignment in, I guess, the core or the main part of the mm-hmm. body and the and being relaxed in the rest of the body. What does that mean just for anyone listening who has never even heard of this concept? Sure. Um, when you're running, you're only on one leg at a time, mm-hmm. right? When you land. When you're on that one leg, it is crucial that your postural lineup is in place, because all of your weight's coming down on one leg and it's coming down at a multiple of your body weight. Mm-hmm. And so if your alignment is off, hips, sways, and back has too much curvature over at the waist, uh, a number of things can happen that if you land with your weight not distributed well through your frame, then it goes to your muscles and joints Mm -hmm. and that's where injuries happen. So I tell people running isn't, doesn't hurt your body. It's the way you run Mm -hmm. that hurts your body. Mm -hmm. And so I just help people really work at keeping their posture really good. And what keeps your posture straight and supported are your core muscles, right? So a lot of people talk about core strength, but nobody really does functional core work, you know, they get a strong core, they get a six pack, whatever, you, you know, but how do you use it? Like, mm-hmm. what do you do with that? Mm-hmm. You know? And so, um, I've shown people that having a strong core is really 
what stabilizes you during that really tiny split second that you're supporting your body on one leg. Yep. And the more balanced you are as you land, the more smoothly you move across the earth and the less impact you create. And what are some examples of, say, you know, drills, exercises or things you have people do to kind of work on this? Well, when I teach a class, um, this sounds crazy, but uh, I teach full day classes usually. And I spend at least the first two or two and a half hours talking only about posture. So before we even take a step, Mm -hmm. they're just standing there all morning, you know, but I get them to align their posture in a way where their bones, ligaments, and tendons are just in a nice straight vertical line. The easiest way for me to do that is to tell somebody to lift themselves up at the crown of their head, just like you hear in yoga class. But if you do that when you're standing and really try to press upward with the crown of your head, it does this interesting thing that it engages your core. Mm -hmm. If you do it right, just naturally engages it. So it's not like you got to do a bunch of crunches or force it or or get stiff. You just lift taller. All of a sudden it aligns your whole body. It's like you're suspended by your head. Mm -hmm. Everything is hanging straight down beneath it. So your bones have to be lined up. And so um, just doing that. And then I have them practice supporting their themselves on one foot and then the other foot, one foot, and the other foot. And then I watch them to make sure that when you're supported on one foot, that your hip doesn't go lateral. Because that's a big issue with a lot of people. That's why IT band is such a big running mm-hmm. injury because mm-hmm. people's core and transverse abdominus is weak. And so every time they hit the ground, their hip goes out to the side. So if your core is strong, that that alignment um, stays intact mm-hmm. the whole time you're moving through your support stance. And then there's the propulsion phase, which is very revolutionary, even though Every Kenyan who's ever run does it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But nobody's ever sat down with a Kenyan and said, you know, how do you guys run so fast? (laughs) You know, they go, I don't know. I just run fast. I've been doing it my whole life. I just run. But no one has sat down and picked apart exactly what makes them really fast. And um, it just happens that chi running has a lot of those basic principles that the Kenyans have run by successfully for so many years. Mm -hmm. And that is as they run with a lean, a forward lean. And I've, you know, I've done videos. I watch videos of the start of the New York City Marathon, for instance. And everybody, the fast guys start off as a pack, right? There's all the Kenyans uh, and they got this huge lean. And there's all the white guys straight up and down trying to keep up with the Kenyans. Okay. What's wrong with that picture? Okay, so the Kenyans already have an advantage right off the bat in Mm -hmm. that they're falling forward. Can I just... Pause you a second there with that. You're, can you explain the difference for someone who might not know between what you mean by a forward lean compared to just kind of folding at the hips and like, you know, basically yeah. pushing your head forward? What, what do you mean by leaning forward? Yeah. Leaning forward. OK, so it comes from Tai Chi. Chi running does. And so the place that I have people direct themselves from where you move from is your center. Mm-hmm. It's called your Dantian in, in Tai Chi, but it's just below your belly button. And it's in the center of your body. If you can imagine the center of mass of your body is somewhere in your lower abdomen. Okay, so I have them focus on that place while they're keeping their posture nice and straight. And then if you keep your posture straight and then just move the center of your body forward ahead of your feet. There's the trick. Ahead of your feet. Most people reach with their legs. So their legs go first and their body catches up. I'm doing it totally differently. The reason why the Kenyans lean is because their entire body is ahead of their feet. Mm -hmm. When you lean like that, then you're actually falling forward. Gravity is helping to propel you forward because it's pulling you down and forward. And so the difference is when you run upright, if you stand upright, your body is not going to move anywhere unless you push it with your legs. Mm -hmm. You'll just stay where you are. It's Newton's second law. You know, body at rest tends to stay at rest. <laughs> and so as soon as you move the center of your body ahead of where your feet are, you become a falling object. Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden, gravity is pulling your center down, but it's ahead of your feet. So you are falling. So when you fall, the difference in workload to your legs 
is that when you can run in a controlled fall, all you have to do is exert the amount of energy to pick up your feet. If you're vertical, you have to exert the energy to push your entire body weight forward. Yeah. Big difference in workload. I could pick up my feet all day. I can't push myself around all day. Mm -hmm. That's way too much work. So, so that's why all the leg injuries for running. And so what would what would uh, someone, you know, is there something they can practice? Is it, I know that my strength training coaches always, always have me um, doing leaning forward kind of as if I was going to fall and then at the last second picking my foot up to practice that lean forward to get mm -hmm. the angle right. But what can someone do who is listening thinking, you know, actually I run very upright or, you know, I run upright, but then I kind of, um, you know, fold forward at the hips and I kind of arch my back into this like S shape. So what can those people listening do to, to practice this and kind of work on it? What they can do basically is start with just keeping their posture straight at okay. all costs. Just start there, lift at the crown of your head, keep straight no matter what. Drop your focus down to your belly. And the best way to practice moving forward is to just run in place. Just picking up your feet in place, running in place. Keep your posture tall, run in place, and then move your belly ahead of your feet. And you will automatically fall into a lean. Okay. So if you try to lean, it gets too heady. You have to yeah. just, just fall. Okay. Yeah, the more you think about it, the less accurate you'll be. <laughs> <laughs> and you know? what is the best way for someone to practice this? Is it just going on a run and doing it? Or is it going to be, you know, you do little short bursts of drills, a, a drill kind of movement, that kind of distance, and then yeah. kind of slowly incorporate it in? Or how should someone bring it in? Well, the best way, because it is so different than normal running, it's I like to teach people as if they've never heard anything about running. And so I take, that's why I start them with posture. Then okay. I start them with just learning how to pick their feet up. Because mm -hmm. most people push off mm -hmm. instead of pick up. So then I do a drill where they're just picking up their feet. And then I teach them how to swing their arms because most people don't know, never been taught how mm -hmm. correctly to swing their arms. And then actually how to move forward without using your legs. So that's why we've developed a whole system of classes and workshops and instructions. Yeah, so tell us about that now. What, what kind of things you offer here? So over the years, we've um, been training. I've been training instructors for 20 years now. So we have hundreds of them all over the world. And if people have learned from our books, so there's a Chi running book, a Chi walking book, and actually a Chi marathon book that's like an owner's manual if you want to do mm -hmm. the long distances. But for the chi runners, there are some people who've learned it out of the book. But what I realized right away is that people need a visual thing. Yeah. Okay, so we made a video that's a DVD that comes that goes with the book. It, they're a nice partnership. So many hundreds of thousands of people have learned through the video. Mm -hmm. And then if you need to make sure that you're doing it right, you can look up a local instructor and they can check in on you or they have regular classes and stuff like that. So. We wanted people to really have a really accurate experience. If you're going to change something as big as your running form, do it well. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Don't just do a piece, you know, read two pages in a book and go, oh, I'm going to go try that, you know, because it works as a whole. So you have to have, you can't just change how your legs move. You have to change how your body falls. You have to change how your arms cooperate with your legs. You have to change how your, what parts of your body to relax and what mm -hmm. parts not to. Mm -hmm. And so it's a pretty holistic kind of system of how to move the body while running. Yeah. And then yeah. tell us about the workshops and the what and the school that you're now offering for people who might be interested yeah. in hearing more about this. Okay, so I have I teach workshops as well as all of our instructors teach regular workshops. People can go on our website, um chi running dot com, C H I running. And um on the left-hand navigation bar, you can. it has a little box that says learn it. And you click on that and it pops you out into how to find an instructor anywhere mm -hmm. in the world. So you can find an instructor that way also. I And they teach classes. I also teach regular classes. I, I'm going to be in San Francisco this fall. I'll be in New York City in the spring and a couple of other cities. And in most major cities, there's a Chi running instructor. And you can look them up online. The other way that I have for people to learn 
that's been working really great because I wanted to be able to teach people who didn't have access to an instructor nearby. So what I came up with was what I call the Chi Running School, which is a series of video and audio lessons. And it's a membership. It's either monthly or annually. You sign up for a membership and every Saturday morning you get delivered into your inbox a video of one lesson, just one aspect. It could be how to swing your arms, could be how to pick up your feet or how to align your posture, how to do a certain track workout, how to do, you know, it's just one lesson. And so I found that if I can get people to just practice one thing Mm -hmm. for an entire week during every run, they learn it much faster. Oh yeah, I'm sure. And then um, it comes with an audio download that you can put into your MP3 player, put it on your iPhone or your smartphone, and then listen to it. So I'm talking you through the lesson every run that week. And you can't go wrong. I mean, you know, there are people who've been practicing this, have been members of the school now for two years. And that's how much material I've produced is 104 lessons. And um, they're like, they could be an instructor. They've learned it so well. Are they allowed to take an instructor class at the end or? Yeah, yeah. They can become a certified instructor Mm -hmm. through their training. We have regular instructor trainings as well. In fact, this is interesting. I'm going to go to China in the spring to teach an instructor training in China. Wow, that's cool. It's really, running is really having a huge boom there as well as in India. And Chi Running is very popular in both places. And it's like. And they have billions of runners. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. We've, uh, I've, I have quite a few uh, runners from India, not so much from China, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe I just don't know about it. Um, in my community, and I know that you know they really appreciate learning, and there's so much to be said. So just oh, hungry yeah. for knowledge. They are. It's exciting. <laughs> so then, for someone who says, "Oh, running just doesn't feel comfortable. Um, it's just you know stressful. My body it just doesn't feel good." Is this something that could turn that around or like, what would you like to say to someone who just thinks that, you know, running isn't meant to be feel good. It's not meant to feel comfortable. That's why it's running. And, you know, I can specifically attest to this with, you know, being a professional runner who stopped running for three months and then starting again, my body just felt terrible. Like I just, I felt so uncoordinated. It was uncomfortable. Every run was just like, a struggle I felt like a cross between like a deer and like the tin man and and it was just horrible <laughs> for a while and you know wow. so I'm just thinking that other people I know have this same thinking especially if they're running for the first time so maybe you could talk to that and explain Absolutely. it doesn't have to be the case <laughs> oh not at all in fact it not only doesn't have to be the case but you can predictably not make it that case I can't tell you how many triathletes for instance say man I love the bike I really love swimming but man, if you can get me to love running, you've got a convert, you know, mm-hmm. a year later, I could talk to the same people and they'd go, God, you know what my favorite sport is now? Yeah, It's running. And they uh-huh. used to hate it. I, I have one of our instructors, in fact, at one point, I think she started to run on a bet or something like that. She couldn't even imagine running to the end of the block, much less, you know, 5K or anything like that. And now she just finished her fifth 50 miler. Wow. And that's, this is somebody who hated running, who yeah. just absolutely said, this isn't me. But I tell you what, if you can learn to run in a way, what I'm trying to show people is how to run really efficiently and really relaxed and without using your legs. Mm-hmm. So if you can imagine, put that into your equation box in your head and go, wow, if we take away the workload from the legs, if I can come back more relaxed than when I take off, And if it's easy on my body where I just don't ever get hurt, what's the downside, you know? And so I've, even for myself, you know, I've been able to go out for a run feeling totally dragged out, you know, like, oh my God, how am I going to get this going today? And coming back with more energy than when I took off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this whole thing about Tai Chi, the idea is to do what it takes to create the conditions for energy to flow through your body. That takes alignment, relaxation, softness in your approach, a good focused mind. It's like a moving meditation and people don't think of running in that way. But once you learn how to move your body in a way that doesn't feel uncomfortable, oh my God, you can go out all day if you feel like it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, 
we have a section. We always we get testimonial emails. People write us, you know, about oh my gosh, this is so cool. I love love the running technique. But we have a separate section in our files of testimonials called love letters, and they are people who have said this changed my life. Mm-hmm. It's not just a cool way to run. It changed my life. All of a sudden, I'm a more relaxed person. Yeah, I, you know, because all of the principles that make Tai Chi such a great sport are the same universal principles that you could start a business with, form a relationship, work on yourself. It's, it's all basic principles, Mm -hmm. alignment. Where do you not need alignment? Mm -hmm. Uh, Let's say you're, you know, just starting to date somebody, man, if you want to form a relationship with them, you need to get aligned with what you want, (laughs) where you're headed. What am I doing here? Okay. You need to stay relaxed, right? Who's going to want to partner this like so uptight. (laughs) They don't know how to handle any kind of situation. So there's all these principles that, you know, weave themselves into the running, but then you can take back out and use them somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. That's the beauty of it. You know, it's really fun. Mm -hmm. I could see that a hundred percent. And I, you know, I seen in myself when I, when I let go of the professional running and I said, you know what, I just want to relax. I just want to be still and be calm and let things kind of happen. It, yeah, it completely permeates into every area of your life and, and it's refreshing. So I could completely see how that would be the case. And, um, for runners who, you know, I know myself when I did start kind of running a little bit again, and I'm still not running very much, like, you know, 15 to 20 miles a week. So compared to yeah. my 90 to 100, this is nothing. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> you know, I noticed at the beginning, I was like trying to force it. And it was very kind of like, I need to remember to pump my arms and I need to remember to make my legs move at a fast cadence and all these different things. And I know this is what a lot of other runners do with trying to almost force it, like thinking, overthinking things. And for me, it took actually running at my previous easy run pace, even though that was a bit harder breathing wise than I wanted at that time for me to understand what I needed to get back to that relaxed state again. Um, And then I could bring it back to the slower, slower paces. But what, so what would you like to say to people who are thinking, you know, what, this sounds great, but I need to, you know, I have bad form, so I need to focus on using my arms and I need to focus on, um, you know, having a 180 cadence or whatever it may be. Maybe tell us a bit about that. Yeah. Well, um, there's a principle in Tai Chi that's called gradual progress. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that principle says that's like a universal law that you don't, start off all at once. You take small increments. Mm-hmm. Everything happens better in small bites. And so if you want to get 180 cadence and you're not there, let's say you have 160 cadence. Um, yes, you want to get your cadence a little faster because at 160, you cannot run correctly. There's so much time spent in your support stance. You, you get wiped out because you're using muscles the mm-hmm. whole time. And so I tell people, well, I, I work with a metronome just beeps away. You know, we, we sell them to people and, and I have a watch that has one on it. So I set, you know, for instance, if somebody has 170 cadence, they really want to get up to 180, but if they start running 180, they're going to get wiped out in a block. So I have them, I measure their cadence, whatever they're running. Let's say it's 165. I set their metronome at 165 and I'll go, okay, now I want you to go out and run at this cadence for a week, 165. Well, that's what you're already doing but you're just learning how to match your body to what the beep says, Mm, right? Okay. Okay. So then after a week, I want you to secretly bump the metronome up one beat. (laughs) Just one. Yeah, just one, just one beat. Because to take one more step in an entire minute, is your body going to feel the difference? Yeah. No, No, it's not not at all. Not at all. One, One more step in a whole minute. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Out of 180 yeah, strides, you do 100. Uh, I mean, 165 strides. If you do 166, your body's going to go. Oh no! Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa! Hold on there. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it's not going to do that. Mm-hmm. It's not going to even notice. And so you run at that cadence for a whole week. Your body gets used to listening. The same sounds, the same feels, the same. The next week, bump it up once again. Oh, I see. Okay. So in 10 weeks, you end up at 180. And it still feels just like it did when you were running mm-hmm. 165, right? Or 15 weeks, whatever that is. 15 weeks, almost three months. 
Okay. So, you know, that's a way to trick your body into getting in great shape and bypassing what your mind wants to do with, Mm -hmm. you know? And so there's all, we have all kinds of tricks to get people to relax, Mm -hmm. take their time, do it well. So, yeah, I mean, I've taught people that had uh, virtually no concept of moving their body faster than a walk. They just like, you know, I will never be a runner. I'm not a runner, but they end up loving this stuff. So, yeah, we have so many, so many stories of people. Yes, you know, wonderful. Definitely have made a difference in people's lives. And, and you know, I know that you've worked with people, you know, all the way up and uh, in level. And you mentioned that, you know, you can see a difference in the elite runners um, compared mm-hmm. to everyone else. And, you know, I was just thinking when you were talking about that, what is the biggest difference you see between the elites and the recreational runners? Is it, you said about the lean, is that what it is that most the elite runners learn how to lean forward correctly? And are there any other differences you see? Well, not all of them do, but they do work harder at it. I mean, they work really hard to strengthen themselves. They work really hard at getting their VO2 max up, their oxygen exchange. They do all kinds of short burst drills. The difference between recreational runners and elites is that elites have the time to be able to put into making themselves above the crowd. Okay. They're either paid to do it or they're in a situation where they can really dedicate a lot of time to do that. When it comes to technique though, um, there's still elite runners that run straight upright. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't win that often, but Paula Radcliffe is a great example. Mm -hmm. Horrible running form. She's like hard to watch, but she has so much strength in her legs that she manages to set a world record. But the elites that do the best are the ones that seem to follow the most of the rules. And it's not about power. It's about their ability to relax more. And I'm sure you know, as a professional runner, that probably some of your best races were when you were the most relaxed. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mentally if you and go physically. Into race, yeah, mentally, everything. I mean, you look at Hussein Bolt run. The guy is like happy mm-hmm. to get out there and do a world record. He's mm-hmm. not sweating it. He's mm-hmm. just like having fun. You know, that's what makes somebody an exceptional runner. And then you add the conditioning on top of a really good running form and you're golden. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, one of our one of our instructors is uh, Katrina McKiernan, who is a famous Irish runner. She in 1989 she she won the uh, Berlin Marathon, Amsterdam Marathon, and the London Marathon. Wow! So, in one year, that's impressive. In one year, and she <laughs> since she beat the Brits, she became an Irish national hero. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, but she she was either she would either win the race. Or she was a DNF. She wouldn't run. And that's because she trained so hard that she was always right on the edge of injury. Mm -hmm. And once she retired from racing and started teaching chi running, she's written me many emails saying, I have so much more fun. I have much more enjoyment than I ever had racing, showing people how to do it really well. And um, she's having a ball. That's but great. she she always says, I wish I would have met you before I started my running career because it would have been completely different. Yeah, it makes you wonder about Polar as well, what she could have done had she had she got oh that together. <laughs> oh, well, Paula. I mean, somebody that has that much ambition, that uh-huh. much drive, you get them to move well too. <laughs> Unstoppable. That's- yeah, well, she was unstoppable anyway, so who knows what that could have been. And, you know, you have yourself have had a lot of success. You know, you oh, well, according to your website, you've run 40 ultras. And yeah. uh, from what I read, it said you finished you top three in all but one. So all but one. For, yeah. for those listeners who are thinking, what? Like, how is that possible? Just as I know there is no real um, answer to this, but what is your secret then? As I know people <laughs> want to know. <laughs> There are actually a couple of secrets, and that is I when I was really when I was doing my racing career in ultra marathons, I constantly, constantly worked on my technique. 
So I was conditioning myself. So back then, that was some of that was before I started chi running. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing more miles. So the, just the conditioning of miles, but also... Can I just pause you there while you're saying about conditioning of miles? Yeah. Does, does it naturally kind of smooth you out over time? Like if you are a higher mileage runner, will that naturally kind of make everything? No, not necessarily. Okay. It's not a guarantee at all. Okay. It just means that you'll be able to, that you have a little more endurance and strength when you need it. Okay. It's like you have a deeper reserve. Okay with the long miles, if you're doing them right. Mm -hmm. Some people run really long miles in training and just beat up their body. So when it comes to racing, they're always kind of on the edge. Yeah. But what I would do is always, uh, I would never train to my max. You know, mm -hmm. I ran a lot of miles, but I would never run a lot of speed. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't taxing my body that way. Plus I was always working on smoothing out my technique with every step. So there was no injuries along the way. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I did was um, technique-based race-specific training. So, for instance, I ran the Leadville 100 as yep. one of my races. And I trained for that specific race. I knew exactly the race profile. I knew when all, all the hills were going to be, how steep they were, how long they were. And I worked my technique to be able to manage my energy through every one of those changes in terrain and everything else. And so I already had the course mastered before I even stepped up to the start line. And so many other people step up to the start line, just trained hard and let's give it my best shot. Yeah, yeah. let's see that's, what happens. That's way different than knowing what's coming up mm -hmm. and managing your energy appropriately. Mm -hmm. So that's how um, in our chi marathon book that's exactly how i teach people to to race is to know your race mm -hmm. train for it oh so, so important so, regardless so, so. of the distance yeah regardless of the distance know the terrain if you're going to go out for a 5k know the course is it hilly somewhere is the last you know the boston marathon screaming they'll start right and then you roll through all these hills and then there's the newton hills which is heartbreak hill you know way up at the top if you're not planning ahead Knowing that that big set of hills is coming up and you start too fast, you're, that's why they call it heartbreak hill. Mm -hmm, <laughs> that's mm -hmm. where the wheels come off. Because if you can get to the top of that in good shape, it's a downhill finish. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the people that do the best there are really smart about how they manage their energy for that specific course. Absolutely. And they've prepared, you know, for that course. I made that mistake in my final marathon I did before I stopped. Uh, didn't, we didn't prepare for the course well enough and you know uh oh. we we heard it was a downhill course but we didn't take account in I, in our heads it was kind of a gradual downhill the whole way but obviously wasn't it was rolling hills and and I just got so beaten up and I was so angry at myself because I've always been someone who's prepared so for anyone listening yeah. what Danny is saying is exactly right it goes a long way so yeah. um and then you're also interested obviously you've kind of mentioned it at points about just the whole, the body as a whole, holistic yeah. health, kind of looking after yourself. So maybe you could give uh, our listeners who are maybe kind of taking these steps to look after their body and mm -hmm. to be just better, you know, holistic beings. Um, what else do you believe is important to like long-term wellness and, and health? Um, for me, long-term wellness is lowering my carbohydrate intake. Okay. So you are a yeah. low carb Person I'm now. a low carb person okay. now, and um, then I feel much better, you know, because if I eat too many carbs, I start having to carry the extra carbs around. <laughs> <laughs> they stick to you somehow. I haven't figured out how it happens. <laughs> but, um, I also eat a pretty, uh, pretty much an organic diet. Yeah, I'm not a vegetarian, a strict vegetarian, but I don't eat that much meat. I mean, I might have some chicken once a week and fish every other week and maybe meat every other week. You know, I, I don't eat a lot. It's not like every day or anything like that, but I do, I do a uh, juicing. Um, I like to garden. So we grow a lot of our own vegetables to put in the juicer. And every morning I have a big tall glass of this green stuff and uh, it uh, looks bad and tastes good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, my wife and I live, you know, pretty clean diet. We, we don't, um, eat a lot of junk, no junk food, no processed food. We cook everything from scratch. So it's kind of a commitment to eat 
well and eat clean. I have read ingredients on packages for years, and there's so many things I just don't even eat anymore. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I don't eat gluten either, and very little dairy. Wow. I try to restrict mm-hmm. gluten and dairy because I've just noticed it kind of makes me feel a little thick. Like, you know, if I have a big pizza with a lot of cheese, I feel like a toad the next morning, <laughs> <laughs> like, a, like a total slug. So just, I, one of the things, the bottom line thing about what we try to teach people through chi running and chi walking and, and chi living as the bigger vision goes that way is to body sense. That's one of the biggest skills anybody could learn is how to sense in your body what's going on. Mm-hmm. It sounds simple, but you know, if people could really learn when their body is talking to them. Body sensing is really a two-way conversation between you, mind, and your body. Mm-hmm. Okay, so when people talk about mind-body work, this is the bottom line mind-body work because you're listening to your body with your mind and then you respond to what your body's asking for or screaming for or telling you it doesn't want to do. And then you listen for a response and then you give another directive, listen for a response. And that's what all of our training programs, that's how all of our classes are designed. So I train people how to listen to their body. If you're running along and you're a beginning runner and your knee starts to hurt, that's your body talking to you. Your body's saying, hey, wait a minute, what are you doing? You know, how are you running in a way that hurts your body? And so then through all these little technique lessons, somebody could say, oh, you know, I might be reaching with my legs because that creates a lot of impact when you Mm -hmm. land. Let me try this. Maybe I'll pull my feet back in underneath me when they land and I'll keep my upper body ahead. You do that and then, then your mind goes, okay, so body, so how's it going? And the body goes, well, you know what? Actually, the knee pain went away, so we're cool. And the mind goes, okay, we're cool. And you continue on down the road. You don't have to keep running with a sore knee till it breaks. You know, you can correct a situation as in, instantly as it comes up. Yeah. And that's why I talk about race specific training, because if you're running along and all of a sudden a hill comes up, you need to change your technique. All of a sudden it's different. You're going up a hill. It's not the same running you do on the flat. You know, you use different parts of your body more or less. And so this body sensing thing is really a wonderful art and a way to teach people how to make it, how to adjust in the moment to whatever needs to happen, Mm -hmm. you know? I love that phrase as well. I'm all about listening to your body as well and people listening know that too, but I've never heard that phrase and that's really cool, body sense. That's 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 something I might might start using. Obviously, I'll mention that you're the one that told me. (laughs) It's it's, it's really great. You know, if, if we were taught in grade school, all the way through school, if all the kids are taught how to body sense, you would stop eating when you were full. You would get up when you've been sitting too long. You would, you know, hold your head different, you know, so you wouldn't get a neck pain. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be looking down at an iPhone like this all day. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you'd be body sensing so that you could make corrections and maintain a higher quality of life because you're paying attention. Yep. Well, hopefully people will be able to take some of this in and start to become more aware and uh, really see what you can do and see if you notice a difference. Okay, one hard question for you before we move on to the final few. So if this is just something, as you are so into holistic health, and you've shown that by what you just told us right there, if you could change one thing about our culture today, what would it be? Oh my gosh, <laughs> like I changed one thing. Told you it's going to be a hard question. I told you at the beginning that you've been interviewed so many times, I was going to throw a few curveballs at you. <laughs> well, there are, there, um, what would I change about our culture? There's a few things I would make illegal. Okay. <laughs> uh, GMO products. <laughs> I would I would steer everybody totally clear of any kind of chemicals in their food. Mm-hmm. You know, stuff like that. I would change that. I you know, stuff would probably cost a little more to produce and things like that, but we wouldn't have all the lifestyle cancers that we have today. Yeah. You know, and oh my god, it's rampant and you know. But that's one place I would start. Don't even okay. get me started. I think on that's politics. a good place to start. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and that's something. Hopefully, over time, it appears to me like it is moving in the right direction. I so. tell people to read your label on your food package. Yeah. You know, read the label. 
If you can read the entire label in one breath. It's a good one. It's okay. Yeah. Well, well then you might get someone who's like a professional diver who can then, you know, <laughs> re- read a label of something that, like a pop tart that has like a hundred ingredients in it. But yeah. <laughs> we'll just we'll just assume those people aren't gonna take part in this challenge. All right. So before I get on for the uh, sponsor message and the running for real four, uh, a new question I'm working at incorporating in here is an Oscar speech. Thanks. If you were to thank some people in a speech, um, obviously keeping mindful that if we, this was an Oscar speech, you know the music would tune you out uh, if you took too long. So, um, who would you like? Who would you thank if you if you could do a speech after all this? Or well, it doesn't have to be an Oscar. It can be something, you know, oh, no, a I lifetime like achievement it. award or something. What would you say? I would say I would I would first of all thank my wife. She was the one that just gave me the idea. There's more to this. Write a book, mm-hmm. teach instructors, get this going. It's who you are and it's what needs to happen. And she also helped form all of that stuff. I would also like to thank all of the teachers that I've had along the way because man, I would be nowhere without um, my Tai Chi, my first Tai Chi teacher who worked with me for nine years and mm-hmm. just totally was was willing to blend running with tai chi instead of just teaching me tai chi like any other chinese guy would do <laughs> so all of my teachers and i would say my wife as well and and, and there's so many people who have encouraged me along oh, the way yeah i'm sure you know it's, you can't oh man i'm still trying to wrap my head around how many people we've influenced yeah i, I wonder if you like, could ever add that together yeah yeah no, i i have no clue you know and <laughs> so Nope, that's amazing. Okay, well, thank you. We are just going to take a moment to thank our sponsor and we'll be back with the Running For Real 4. I may have stopped running, but one of my favourite sponsors still makes its way into my food every day. Generation Ucan. You probably already know I'm a huge fan of Ucan. No, I used it as my sole fuel source in my 236 marathon. And yes, I was a little bit scared I would bonk, but my energy levels felt exactly the same the entire way. I didn't have those ups and downs, the sugar highs and sugar lows that gels gave me. But maybe you're thinking, yeah, yeah, Tina likes UCAN, but what is it? Well, UCAN is a carbohydrate source originally created for a little boy named Jonah, who continually had low blood sugar. Years later, UCAN is a favourite amongst many elites, including everyone's favourite, Meb Kaplesky. You can is giving Running For Real listeners 10% off using code Running For Real. So check out generationucan.com for more about You Can and learn how it can help you control your blood sugar, fuel your races, and maybe make those bottomless pit stomachs of ours be happy for just a little bit longer post run. All right, Danny, just four more questions for you, starting with a unique nutrition tip. And in theory, you don't have to answer this one if you don't want to, as you have given us your nutritional insight. But if you had something in mind, you can feel free to share. So I have one uh, nutritional tip that has really helped me a lot. And that is that I really only eat one main meal a day instead of three meals, as I, especially as I age. When you're younger, you can probably get away with three meals a day. But as you age, your body doesn't burn through as many calories, doesn't mm-hmm. need as many calories. So I eat one meal midday and um, I start off the day with my juice and that lasts me until I can have my mid midday meal. And then in the evening, I just have like a little bowl of frozen fruit or something like that. And, um, and then the other thing with that is I don't eat past eight o'clock at night. Okay. Yep. That's an so, important one. And yep. that's good. Okay, thank you. Uh, what about a running for real moment? Uh, a moment that only runners will understand. Only runners will understand. Well, I've been running now for 46 years. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Longer than some people have been on the planet. So, you know, as I'm getting, as I get older, I'm noticing that there are many times when I would just rather walk. I live in Asheville, North Carolina. We have gorgeous trails here, mountains. Sometimes I just want to appreciate my life and take it slow for a bit. And sometimes I'll just find a nice clearing. I'll stop and I'll do some Tai Chi and I'll get back up and I'll run a little more. And I just kind of mix it. So I'm not as pressed to get a good workout in, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's, it's, I just take it a lot much uh, easier. I never took my running seriously, (laughs) which is funny because. Probably a good thing to have though. A good uh, it's, it's a mm. really great exercise to have. Mm-hmm. So anyway, 
that's what I do. I just take it really easy on my runs. I really want to, I'd rather just enjoy the fact that I can run, enjoy the fact that I don't have to. Okay. Thank you very much. And what about a high moment in your running or maybe your work career? I would say a couple. Uh, one high moment for sure was when I finished the Leadville 100. And that was um, my first 100 miler. Mm -hmm. And I trained really hard for it up in the high country in Colorado. And I was able to finish eighth overall wow. on my first attempt at a 100 miler. Mm -hmm. So I feel, felt really good about that. Yeah. And then the other thing that the, is a really high moment is, like I just said, watching chi running grow yeah. so big across the world and how many people's lives we've affected positively. Like I said, all the emails and stuff that is just totally heartwarming. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And, and you deserve it. You, you put in the work and you have helped thousands and thousands of people. So it, it's, it's great. And you deserve that. Yeah. And then finally, what would you, what do you tell yourself when you're standing on the start line of a race? Um, a couple of things. One is, so I've raced a lot. <laughs> <laughs> And one thing I tell myself is to keep moving. So I don't want to be stagnant and just standing still before a race because I want to have my energy moving when I start. So, mm -hmm. so I always keep moving around. I keep pretty active. The other thing I do is that I always like to start near the front. If there's no corrals, I'll go right up to the start line. Okay. I don't care if I'm standing next to Kenyans or the world champions or whatever, I'll get as close to the front as I can because when I take off, everybody faster than me blows out in front of me. Anybody slower than me is behind me. And so the field always opens up. I'm, <laughs> I can be in the most crowded marathon and it's empty around me. <laughs> so, um, so I always tell myself, you know, just, and especially at the start of a race, contain yourself, That's contain yourself. Yeah. So, before the race, I always practice my start pace, what it feels, body sensing, what it feels like in my body. And so that I just hone back in on that. I don't care how many people are shooting by me or anything like that. I'm just maintaining this nice central feeling of this is the right pace. That's good. And so that's that's how I do it. Yeah, I think more people need to kind of feel that way when they're when they're starting out a race rather than just trying to go out with a. The, the fastest in the field. <laughs> then no, that's Fly great. And die, we call it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one way of putting it. So finally, um, I have my guests send me a photo of them standing in a power pose. So something you could do, maybe a Tai Chi move or something uh, where you're standing in a way that would build your confidence and help you feel good about yourself. Will you send us your power pose? Oh, definitely. Okay, great. Well, Danny, thank you so much for coming on the show today. This has been so much fun yeah. to learn more from you. And I will put lots of links in the show notes for everyone listening to go find out more and to kind of see what workshops are nearby. You know, if you have an instructor nearby, all that kind of stuff will be in the show notes. But Danny, thank you so much for Wonderful. your time. It was really fun, Tina. It was great doing interviews with you. Isn't it interesting and makes total sense? You know, I really like the idea of the school he was saying about. So it gives you one thing to work out on for an entire week because I feel like I would definitely benefit from that style a bit more than having everything in one go. It's a little bit overwhelming. But obviously it's up to you and what seems to work for you. Now, we all know what that sense of flow feels like, but hopefully from today you kind of got that, that, you know, we could be feeling it a lot more often. You know, we're trying to force things so often, but for most of us, it just doesn't work. And, you know, it's really uncomfortable a lot of the time. So hopefully you got a lot out of this interview today and you enjoyed it. You can find everything we talked about in the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 24. And I want to thank you for listening today. Thank you for taking the time to spend it with me and Danny. That really means so much to me. I hope you will subscribe if you haven't already to the Running For Real podcast so you can get it right to your podcast player or right to your phone or however you listen to it immediately upon release. I'll send it to you bright and early on a Friday morning. So next week, I have Nancy Clark, who is a registered dietitian. I have had on Run to the Top before, but I've been working with her personally the last few months, and she is just great. You know, I've learned so much about how to fuel as a runner, what mistakes I was making, and honestly, the chances are you're probably making some of those too. So you do not want to miss out on those. It was pretty eye-opening for me, and I think it will be for you too. 
nutrition, you know, it really is the key to us running our best. So make sure you check that one out next week. I hope you have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.